All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, tonight's uh, ESID Grand Rounds webinar will start. Uh, I welcome you all. We have we will have an exciting uh, one hour ahead of us, and uh, we will be discussing the management of COVID patients with type one interferon pathway defects. Welcome, everyone. I'm I will be your moderator. I'm Mikko Seppanen from Helsinki, and uh, there will be presenters. Uh, these are Sebastian Ochoa Gonzalez uh, from NIH. Uh, he's a, a clinical. Uh, he's a, he is a clinical fellow at NIH presently. And then there, the next uh, patients will be presented by Natalie Cheik, who is a pediatrician in Besancon. Besançon, France, and then Paul Bastard, who is uh, uh, a resident uh, pediatrician uh, in Imagine Institute, Paris, France. And panel members are Mihai Leonakis from uh, NIH. He's a, uh, uh, he's a uh, researcher investigator there, and then Benedictine. Uh, Benedict Neven from Necker Children's Hospital. Welcome all, and let us start uh, uh, first by declaring that no panel members or presenters have no uh, have any conflicts of interest. First, we will have the case of episode and severe COVID nineteen, uh, and. Uh, Let's have Sebastian pop start. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Nico, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you guys about COVID-19 in patients with APS-1, also known as APACET, which stands for autoimmune polyendocrinopathy, candidiasis, and ectodermal dystrophy. We will specifically discuss therapeutic interventions in patients with severe COVID-19, but before I do so, I want to go back to the summer of 2020 in the earlier months of the COVID-19 pandemic. The observation that type one interferon pathways are important for host defense against SARS-CoV-2 led to explorations of both genetic and acquired defects in this pathway to try and explain severe disease. And one hypothesis uh, that severe disease uh, for severe disease in COVID-19 in otherwise healthy individuals with no risk factors um, uh, was postulated that this could, this could be related to uh, ultra antibodies to type 1 interferons. And in 2020, uh, uh, Paul Bastard and John Laurent Casanova's group with, in, with our NIH colleagues and many others uh, tested this hypothesis and showed that around 10% of adults with severe disease have neutralized ultra antibodies to type 1 interferons, which were only found in 0.3% of healthy controls. This 10% of patients actually included two APACET patients from our NIH cohort who both had severe disease. And like most patients with APACET, uh, like our patients from this cohort and, and most patients with APACET, they had ultra antibodies with type 1 interference at baseline. At the NIH, we follow a large cohort of APACET patients that live in countries around the world. And early in the pandemic, we became very concerned. Next, we began to learn from our own cohort and from other cohorts that patients with APACET develop severe disease. Uh, if you can uh, proceed to the next slide, please. Uh, so we began to learn that, uh, uh, um, that they develop severe disease. And over the past year, we've collected data from 22 patients with APACET in COVID-19. And we uh, noted that they have high rates of mechanical ventilation, high rates of ICU requirement, and high rates of mortality. Now, why they did poorly is not entirely clear to us. Patients with APACET, next slide, have a defect in central tolerance caused by deleterious mutations in ergine, a gene that is expressed in medullary thymic epithelial cells that plays a key role in cell antigen presentation and negative selection, selection of outer active T cells. If you could go back one slide. Yeah, thank you. As a result, uh, these patients have multiple autoimmune manifestations, including the classical triad of autoimmune adrenal insufficiency, hypoparathyroidism, and chronic cutaneous candidiasis. These patients also develop ultra antibodies to various cytokines, and that includes uh, interferon alpha and interferon omega, 
As most patients, nearly all of them have autoantibodies to these interferons, but only a minority develop autoantibodies to interferon beta, which has been postulated to explain why they don't get, uh, 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 um, they're not particularly susceptible in general, in general to severe viral diseases. So after we learned that these patients have a higher rate of severe COVID-19 and a probable molecular basis for severe disease, we became very interested in implementing therapies that could potentially improve their outcomes. In some of these therapies we will be discussing today, randomized controlled trials in patients with COVID-19 have already identified a handful of therapies that either reduce mortality, hospitalization requirement, and or progression to severe disease in the general population. Uh, next slide. One such treatment strategy are monoclonal antibodies that spike. These ultra -antibo these antibodies, sorry, have shown a high affinity, uh, binding affinity to spike protein, and they interfere with binding to ACE2. The combination of banlanimumab and etesevimab, which I'm going to refer uh, here onward as um, uh, the antibody cocktail, has been approved uh, in outpatients after they sh uh, um, um, showed a reduction in hospitalization rates. So what I'm showing you here is unpublished data from a phase three trial that was looking at high-risk patients with COVID-19 who received this antibody cocktail. These results showed a reduction in a composite outcome that includes hospitalization and deaths. And interestingly, all 10 deaths occurred in the placebo group. Now, this is unpublished data. This has not yet been peer reviewed, uh, but based on prior data to this, um, current NIH guidelines and others recommend the use of this antibody cocktail in outpatients with risk factors for severe disease. And although the antibodies to spike protein had, of course, not been studied in patients with APICET, uh, we extrapolated the findings because we considered our patients to be a high risk group. And with this, I'm going to start with our first case. Next. Our first case is a 37 year old male uh, with homozygous 13 base pair deletions in air gene. His past medical history includes quite significant obesity, class three obesity with a BMI of 42 which of course, as you guys know, puts him at risk of severe COVID-19. His children became symptomatic with COVID-19. Uh, and a few days later, he himself developed fever, dry cough, exertional dyspnea, and headache. He tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR two days after symptom onset. Um, next, his clinical manifestations of Apicet, uh, I'm showing you here. Uh, I want to emphasize one in particular, which is pneumonitis which is not uncommon in patients with APICET. Uh, and it may be uh, undiagnosed and confused with asthma or other chronic pulmonary diseases, but I think it's particularly relevant in the context of a virus that induces lung inflammation. Uh, so knowing uh, the high risk of progression to severe COVID-19 in this patient population, uh, and the fact that he already had other risk factors like being obese uh, and very, very likely having pneumonitis um, as a risk factor, so very likely risk factor, we prophylactically admitted him to the NIH uh, on day five after symptom onset. Next, um, the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, can you go back one slide? Thanks. So his vital signs on admission were unremarkable. Uh, notably, he was a febrile and his oxygen saturation was 98%. Uh, in the previous slide, I showed you that uh, we tested him for COVID-19 and he had a, uh, a positive um, a cycle threshold value of 13.6, indicative of a high viral load. The laboratory studies on admission, which I'm not showing here, showed a decreased absolute lymphocyte count, um, elevated uh, C-reactive protein, elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, D-dimer, uh, and lactate dehydrogenase, and as well as fibrinogen. His ferritin was normal. Next, uh, here I'm showing you his initial imaging. His chest x-ray showed left lower lung airspace disease. His chest CT uh, revealed bilateral left greater than right ground glass opacities, and the CT angio um, showed multiple artery filling defects that were consistent with small pulmonary emboli. So here we have an obese individual with apicet in COVID-19 with thrombotic complications and asymmetric ground glass opacities. On day six after symptom onset, next, he received uh, the antibody cocktail over a two-hour infusion after pre-medication with cetirizine and Tylenol, uh, and he tolerated it well. Because of the low CT value suggesting high viral load, we added remdesivir, we also added doxycycline and ceftriaxone uh, for coverage of community-acquired pneumonia, because uh, mostly because of the asymmetric infiltrates and the possibility of, of missing this uh, could be uh, pretty catastrophic in him. And we also added enoxaparin for pulmonary emboli. On day six, he became febrile. Um, next, 
and uh, hypoxemic, his Tmax was 39.5 and his SpO2 91%. So at this point, we decided to add methylprednisolone, and I really want to emphasize this. We added methylprednisolone 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, which has shown to improve outcomes in the general population of uh, severe uh, COVID patients that are hypoxemic, but I, we think it's particularly important in patients with APACET. In the most recent case series published in the Journal of Experimental Medicine, we observed, and oh, this is an observational, uh, uh, this is observational data, but we observed uh, uh, that patients in whom steroids were started early who were hypoxemic, did much better than patients who were hypoxemic in whom steroids were started late. Actually, those who had late, um, uh, delayed uh, uh, onset of therapy with steroids um, had a very high mortality rate. So uh, the other thing I wanna mention is we did not start interferon beta in this patient who already had um, significant lung inflammation and was well into his sixth day of his disease. So let me show you how his vitals evolved over time. Uh, his temperature um, peaked and uh, was, uh, he was favorable for around three days and then it uh, came down. His SpO2 over FiO2 ratio dropped around day six and improved over the course of seven days. And oxygen was able to be discontinued uh, 14 days after symptom onset. Next, his laboratory tests uh, also uh, improved. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 CT value um, uh, became higher over time, in indicative of decreased viral RNA copy number. His absolute lymphocyte count reached an adhere around day six and normalized by day nine. And his CRP, ESR, and D-dimer all improved within a few days. Next. His imaging, I'm showing you here, uh, chest x-ray and CT at baseline on admission and at day seven, and there is a clear improvement in his lung infiltrates over the course of seven days. So in total, he received eight days of bandlanimumab and at, at the seven map, he received six days of remdesivir and he was able to be discharged without further complications. Now I'm going to briefly mention uh, the patient's sister next. She is a 39 year old woman with also homozygous 13 base pair deletions in air. She was exposed to her brother and developed headache and ultra sense of smell um, and she developed eventually cough and dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain. We prophylactically admitted her to the NIH at three days after symptom onset, and a saliva test for SARS-CoV-2 uh, was positive with a CT value of 21.3. Next, I want to emphasize that she has asthma uh, as well as a risk factor, and these are her apicet manifestations. As you can see, she does not have pneumonitis, unlike her brother, and her BMI uh, was normal. Her emission vitals, which I'm not showing you, uh, were completely normal. She was not hypoxemic. Her laboratory uh, a test uh, at, uh, at admission, including uh, ALC, CRP, ESR, D-dimer, LDH, fibrinogen, and ferritin, as well as her imaging studies, were all normal. And on day four after symptom onset, next, she received a two-hour infusion of uh, uh, the antibody cocktail, which she tolerated well with pre-medication. Pre uh, a couple of days later, she had resolution of her um, uh, taste uh, and uh, absent uh, taste and smell, cough, dyspnea, and headache. And she was discharged on day five after symptom onset without further complications. Now I wanna show you the autoantibody status of both patients. Next. Both patients had autoantibodies to interferon alpha and interferon omega, but not beta. What we did here in the upper, we're testing for interferon alpha autoantibodies, and in the bottom, we're testing for interferon omega. And we've combined data for both patients. What we did here, we, we obtained donor cells, healthy volunteer donor cells, and we exposed them to the patient's serum. We added interferon alpha or interferon omega, respectively. And then we measured phosphostat one by flow cytometry. As you can see, with just 10% of patient plasma, there is no phosphostat one activity showing that these autoantibodies are indeed neutralizing. And the plasma was serially, serially diluted until stat one function was restored. Uh, and then these values were reported in, um, in the figure that you're seeing in the left to generate these um, IC50 curves. So both patients had similar levels of neutralizing antibodies, perhaps slightly better for patient one. Uh, but I wanted to show you this uh, because now we will hear from the other speakers about therapies that more directly target what we think could be a plausible mechanism for severe disease in these patients. And with this, I want to pass it on to the next speaker and thank you for your time. Yes, thank you, Sebastian, for introducing me. So I will present you a case report 
um, of an 11 year old boy uh, that was uh, he uh, who was excuse me uh, diagnosed with a uh, APS1 syndrome uh, while he was two years old in 2011. Uh, so this patient was diagnosed with APS1 syndrome at the age of two uh, with a double heterozygous mutation in air. He had no history of severe viral infection. He was normally vaccinated with, without adverse events. Um, his uh, apposed symptoms are a cirrhotic autoimmune hepatitis and cholangitis. Uh, he also had oropharyngeal and nail candidosis uh, that in the nail dystrophy persisted after the treatment of the candidosis. Uh, at the age of five, he presented alopecia. And uh, at the age of six, he was diagnosed with a uh, hypoparathyroidism and adrenal insufficiency. Uh, so this patient was uh, under tacrolimus and uh, also hydrocortisone, fludrocortisone and uh, alpha calcidiol. Uh, so this patient was hospitalized uh, in no November the 3rd uh, because of a fever and abdominal pain. Uh, his nasopharyngeal RT-PCR was positive to SARS-CoV-2 virus. And mm -hmm. uh, at day three of evolution, he was admitted in ICU for ARDS. Here we go. So this was the first slide. Now this was the clinical presentation. And here we are. So this is an image of the CT scan uh, that was performed at day three uh, of evolution of his uh, COVID-19, uh, which showed typical bilateral COVID-19 pneumonia involving 50 to 75% of the lungs. Uh, there was no sign of sore infection and no pulmonary embolism. Um, he had a C-reactive protein very elevated at 161 milligram per liter and also elevated D-dimers and fibrinogen. Um, his uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, RT-PCR um, was very elevated with a CT at 11. Uh, he rapidly required mechanical ventilation uh, at day six. Uh, he underwent uh, dexamethasone uh, medication for 10 days. And um, at day 16 of uh, evolution, because uh, the respiratory parameters were very critical, uh, the pediatrician that, take, that took care of him uh, called for immunologist for uh, discussing the indication of a treatment with um, convalescent plasma. Um, at that time, I contacted Benedict Neven and Paul Bastard uh, at the Necker Hospital. And uh, because of the high probability uh, that this patient uh, may have circulating neutralizing anti-interferon autoantibody, uh, we performed uh, plasmapheresis, uh, started uh, on day six, on day 16, sorry, uh, for uh, seven sessions. And each one was compensated with convalescent plasma. And uh, this treatment was associated with a beta interferon administration uh, that we did three times um, uh, every 48 hours. Um, the clinical evolution become favorable um, and this patient uh, was um, better from day 18, so two days after we started the plasmapheresis. And uh, at day 76, the COVID-19 LE spot showed high rate of T lymphocyte uh, directed against the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and at day 31, he was extubated. Okay, 
Thank you very much. I think it's it's my turn now. So hi everyone, I'm Paul. Um, so thanks uh, Natalie and Sebastian for the kind introduction and uh, the, this, these very interesting case reports. So as Sebastian mentioned, uh, we were, uh, we found a few months ago, uh, two sort of underlying causes of life-threatening COVID-19, either genetic deficiencies in the type one interferon pathway, uh, the production or the response that depend on RF7 and TLR7, or as Sebastian mentioned, autoantibodies that are at high titers and neutralizing interferon alpha-2 and or interferon omega. And um, as, as you know, actually virtually all patients have almost since the first years of life, autoantibodies against these two interferons. So um, what did we know previously about these? Uh, well, they were known since the 1980s, which is quite surprising, mostly in patients treated with interferon alpha or beta, also in a small subset of women with lupus, and from 2006 onwards, as we mentioned, in all patients with uh, APS1 uh, due to uh, loss of function variants in air. And so they were thought to be clinically silent until um, actually 2015, when the Luigi Notarangelo's team at the NIH uh, described patients with hypomorphic mutations in RAG1 and RAG2 who um, had autoantibodies type 1 interferon and viral infections. Actually, when we look in the literature, in, 19, in 1984, um, Ian Grasser had described one patient with severe varicella and autoantibodies to type 1 interferon. So it was actually known since a long time ago. And finally, unfortunately, COVID-19 arrived. And uh, from, 20, from the beginning of the pandemic, we heard several cases of apicide patients, including the one that Natalie just uh, described, who had very uh, severe course of COVID-19. And uh, based on this observation and what we knew from uh, the genetic studies, uh, we found that a substantial number of patients, at least 10% of critical patients, had high titers of neutralizing autoantibodies that could block mostly all 13 interferon alphas and interferon omega. And uh, as you can see in the lower right panel, um, these autoantibodies can completely block the protective effects of interferon alpha against SARS-CoV-2, thus leading to very early viral replication. And this is what we saw in, in our patient in, uh, that Natalie took care of. And so for this patient, uh, since uh, we, we knew that uh, APS1 patients had autoantibodies type 1 interferons, uh, we, when we heard about the severe COVID-19 and that the patient was already in the ICU, well, we decided to uh, treat him with Benedict and after discussing also, also with Mihalis um, to, the, to do several lines of treatment. One of them was plasmapheresis. Uh, and as you can see here, we measured the interferon alpha titers before and after each, uh, plasma, each plasmapheresis. And so before, um, the titers were very high above threshold. After the first one, it was still very high, so this is not unexpected. But then um, after these uh, daily plasmapheresis, we saw a sharp decrease in the autoantibody titers until finally, when we stopped, we saw the autoantibodies increasing again. So this was quite reassuring uh, that our uh, plasma exchange or plasmapheresis were efficient. And as Natalie mentioned, in addition to plasmapheresis and convalescent plasma, um, because the patient did not have autoantibodies against interferon beta, we decided to treat him with injectable uh, interferon beta. And so we did one just after the first plasmapheresis, after the third, and after the fifth, so every 48 hours. And we also measured the ISG score with uh, Yanni Crow's lab uh, at the same time points as we did the uh, autoantibody measurements. And here it's very interesting because before the first plasma exchange, and so here the patient had a very high CRP, was in the ICU intubated, uh, the ISG score was completely negative. So there was no response to type 1 interferons. We, and then we did the plasmapheresis and interferon beta. And so short, 
the next day, we already see a very high ISD response that maintains itself uh, for the whole week and that negatively correlates with the CRP who actually went down relatively quickly. So here we see the effect of type 1 interferons, um, which I think uh, we're able to control the viral replication. Uh, and overall, uh, the patient got much better quickly, as Natalie mentioned. So another thing to know for these APICET patients is that we also found these high titer autoantibodies in patients that do not have APICET but that suffered from adverse reactions following yellow fever vaccination. So why yellow fever? Well, it's a live attenuated vaccine. And um, it was also shown to have uh, adverse events in patients with if not one deficiency, for example. And so in these three patients out of, uh, out of seven, which is kind of a lot, who had an adverse event following yellow fever vaccination, we found these high titer autoantibodies and we showed again, teaming up with Charlie Rice's lab, um, that the autoantibodies could block the protective effect and lead to high yellow fever uh, vaccine strain replication. And so the conclusion here is that APS1 patients should not be vaccinated with yellow fever vaccine or other lab attenuated vaccines. Obviously, we know that all of these children uh, have been vaccinated with MMR without any severe reaction. Uh, so this most likely applies only for the vaccines that, uh, such as yellow fever and perhaps uh, VZV. So in conclusion, um, APS1 patients all have autoantibodies uh, almost from the first years of life that are at high titers and able to neutralize very high amounts of type 1 interferons as Sebastian showed. They underlie the course of severe COVID-19 uh, upon infection. Um, we'll, we can rediscuss this later, but probably early treatment with interferon beta, monoclonal antibodies, and or plasmapheresis, depending on the stage, can be helpful to prevent uh, the development of a severe course. Steroid treatments and or plasmapheresis, again, um, perhaps without monoclonal antibodies, not sure, can be used as a, at a later stage. And these patients, uh, if they have not been infected yet, should be offered as quickly as possible uh, vaccination with the uh, mRNA vaccine. And uh, finally, uh, we would strongly recommend avoiding uh, yellow fever virus vaccination, and obviously then traveling to a yellow fever virus endemic area. So with that, I'd like to thank, well, all of you for listening, the patients and their families who accepted to participate. Uh, the team at the Besançon Hospital, the team in uh, Jean-Laurent Casanova and Laurent Abel's lab, especially the autoantibody team that you see here, um, Romain, Olivier, and Benedict who helped a lot at the Necker Hospital, uh, our NIH, NIH colleagues, Mihalis, Helen, and Gigi, uh, Sebastian and Lindsay, of course, and Charlie Rice's lab who performed these, uh, these experiments. And uh, I think now I'm happy to take questions. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, it would be now time for Q&A. There are no open questions yet, but uh, I will ask first uh, Sebastian. Uh, so you already actually mentioned there that uh, the, your studies have already uh, given some data on how we would advise opposite patients uh, in regard to uh, a yellow fever vaccine uh, and travel to endemic areas. What about the other uh, live vaccines? Have you any data on that? So, so far, um, we don't have any evidence that uh, uh, they do poorly uh, with the live vaccines in terms of, the, there, there is a concern, I think a general concern that uh, these patients will somehow um, mount a, a worse uh, autoimmune response to vaccinations. And, and, and I think uh, we, we really have not observed that. Um, and, I, and I think the, the, you know, uh, the, the caution or, or the hesitation of some providers to recommend vaccines. And I think that applies for both live and killed vaccines uh, and component vaccines. I think, I think it, you know, it, it shouldn't be a concern you know, in most cases. We have not seen a signal for worsening autoimmunity in these patients with, you know, with vaccinations. Aside from yellow fever, I don't know of cases 
uh, where uh, APSET patients have had problems with viral replication or viral disease uh, with uh, um, uh, a vaccine strain viruses. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Leonakis has seen any cases. I, I'm, I'm not sure I've, I've seen uh, that this is a concern, aside from the yellow fever virus. Uh, all right. Uh, there are now, there's a question on whether the strain of uh, COVID could uh, make any difference for the type 1 interferon de deficient patients. Did any of you test for the strains whether they of any uh, the so called wild type or uh, were they any of the uh, newly emerged endemic? Uh, uh, variants for the patients. Sebastian, Nathalie, did you test for variants? Did you uh, no. PCR the virus? Yeah, in, in our case in particular, we have not, uh, in the patients that I presented today, we have not tested for uh, which particular variant caused their disease. Yeah. So we have not tested for that. And the one that I presented, uh, was in uh, November, so we didn't test for variants at that moment. Do we have any information on whether the variant does a difference? I think that it will do, uh, it will create a severe disease with very high probability anyhow, uh, whatever the uh, variant is. So I doubt if it's of any clinical consequence because we are in an emergency situation anyhow and we need to do everything in our power. So I think uh, we will have to wait for the data to emerge. Uh, and I see all the panelists nodding. Okay, and now there is another question. Uh, I think this would be probably most to Paul and perhaps only to Mihail, also to Mihail. Have you detected anti-interferon antibodies in patients with NF-kappa beta deficiency? Yeah, that's a great question. We still haven't confirmed it, but uh, yes, we have. Uh, and we're happy to test any NF-kappa B uh, patient, uh, any patient with a genetic defect in the NF-kappa B pathway. It's not very clear yet uh, which ones, which NF-kappa B defects underlie autoantibodies type 1 interferons, but I think it's fascinating, especially with uh, the link to the, to the thymus, so definitely. I don't know if Mihalis or Benedict want to add something. Can I or can I ask whether you have tested NF kappa beta one, NF kappa beta two, or other pathway defects? Yes, uh, we started, uh, and the first data seems to show that uh, it's probably more present in patients with NF kappa B two. Yeah, yeah, that sounds logical. Still to be confirmed, but it, yeah. it would make sense. Yeah. Have you tested in any nf kappa beta one patients that would uh, present as combined immunodeficiency, clearly combi clear combined immunodeficiency? Um, I think we have uh, a few, but probably less than 10, right, Benedict? And uh, so far, I don't think we've found any autoantibody positive. Yeah. Uh, Chauvin asks, would you advise prophylactic monoclonal antibody to protect patients who cannot be vaccinated? For example, children in many countries. Who wants to answer? If the patient is infected with the COVID-19, of course, he needs to receive uh, some sort of uh, treatment, uh, probably monoclonal antibody as uh, as quickly as possible, but uh, giving uh, these uh, on monoclonal antibodies prophylactically, um, I don't know. So you recommend, you recommend to use them very actively and preemptively, but yeah. not prophylactically. Yeah. The idea is to make the diagnosis of this patient as quickly as possible uh, if they have a, a contact or if they have a very mild uh, respiratory symptoms, they have to be tested. Um, but I'm not aware of any experience uh, in preemptive treatment with these monoclonal antibodies. Uh, Mihail, does NIH have any data? Uh, we have not uh, used it for children uh, 
who have not been infected or adults who have not been infected. I think, you know, prioritizing vaccination would be ideal there. Uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Benedict uh, tried uh, as, you know, in children, uh, the monoclonals after, as prophylaxis after they got uh, infected. And maybe maybe you can elaborate a little bit because that kind of be useful for people with regards to it was, uh, effect, uh, you know, the safety of it and the dose you gave maybe. So since uh, we are all aware of the high risk of uh, COVID in this patient, we, uh, uh, of course, alert all the colleagues and uh, we were aware of uh, uh, three patients, uh, three brothers and sisters who uh, uh, contracted the, the virus and we were um, contacted at the very beginning of the symptoms, uh, even when they were asymptomatic and they all received the uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies uh, in conjunction with the uh, type uh, of, uh, with beta interferon. And all the three uh, had a very good uh, evolution uh, with a very mild course. So we think it's a very good um, way of managing this patient. Of course, the best, as you said, is to vaccinate this patient. And uh, I saw that there were questions about vaccination in, in children. Uh, it's not uh, allowed yet to vaccinate children, but in France, at least, we obtain um, the authorization by the authorities, medical authorities, to vaccinate Apicet uh, children. So we've started to uh, offer the uh, uh, RNA vaccination in this patient, and uh, uh, it's too early to, to say about uh, uh, strong response, but the, the very first result we have showed that uh, they were able to make uh, antibodies. So it's uh, quite encouraging, and we hope that uh, uh, all patients will be uh, vaccinated very soon. Uh, and then uh, there was a question on, can we give COVID-19 vaccine to the opposite patients? But uh, Benedict actually already replied to that because I think uh, as early as we can, we need to vaccinate all the opposite patients and all the type one interferon or lo loss of function defects. I think they would be the first in line uh, when, you, when it comes to uh, immunodeficiencies. Uh, uh, can, uh, do you recommend uh, mRNA vaccine to patients with severe MIS-C infection in order to boost antiviral immunity against the virus? Now, this is a very, um, heated topic, I think. There are uh, reports of, of uh, chronic uh, 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 or long COVID responding to uh, uh, anecdotal evidence of, of uh, people who have gotten better with long COVID. And now uh, we are asked whether you should do that in Miss C as well. Does anyone want to comment on that? I don't know that we have really data to 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 make an you know much of uh, uh, an educated uh, you know uh, even guess. So I would I, I don't know what uh, what else to say on this one. Yeah, I would also I would not say anything actually. I don't think the the the, the long COVID and and uh, whether there's any effect it needs to be shown and it's not shown yet. Uh, uh, it needs to be studied. And when it comes to Missy, I have, if there's information, I, and it seems all the panelists have completely missed it. <laughs> of course, you never know with COVID whether you missed one report in the middle of 10,000 reports appearing every day, but anyhow. Uh, uh, and then this is a very, I think a very uh, poignant question. Do you recommend checking anti-interferon antibodies in the patients with severe COVID-19 as routine? Does any of you test them routinely? We do here. Yeah, in Paris, uh, in our lab, we do it. And uh, several uh, clinical labs uh, also do it uh, as a, uh, a test that you can ask uh, for any inpatient. Um, so obviously for any patient with severe COVID-19, but if you think in terms of treatment, it might be too late to see the autoantibodies then, they're already in the ICU. 
Uh, so ideally, it, it should be, it could be done in any patient infected with COVID. Because then if you're early enough and the patient is not so severe or asymptomatic, you can think of giving, uh, giving any of the treatments that you would give to an APACET patient. So I'm definitely for it. <laughs> but I'm biased, obviously. Yeah, I'd, I'd say we, that we have, yeah. We test also here. I think, you know, the patients who have severe disease and I think uh, after... Paul's paper uh, last year, I think, you know, this now reproduced in several countries and continents, you know, pretty significant 10 to 15% of patients with severe COVID do have uh, neutralizing autoantibodies. And that's what we found also in the patients we've admitted here at NH. All right. I agree with Paul otherwise, everything else. Yeah. I think that's a question of availability. Uh, most of the places on earth don't have the availability. And, and many of the clinical labs are just flooded with samples so that they get the responses very late if they do it you know, commercially. Uh, and uh, so it's a question of facilities and, and, and whether you can do that or cannot do that. I would love to do it to everyone, but I'm not, do, I'm not doing it because of this. Uh, but if you live close to Washington DC or Paris, uh, you are lucky enough to order them, I guess. Uh, then, uh, can the panelists recommend what treatment they would recommend for an apposite patient presenting early with PCR positive COVID, but still not very symptomatic? So this is a early non-hypoxemic patient, clearly. Uh, what do you do? Uh, uh, this is Siobhan asking, and um, I think this is a question that everybody would ask. Who wants to reply? Mihai? The diagnosis is made very early. I think the monoclonal antibodies is really the, the best treatment we can offer. Uh, the question is more tricky if the diagnosis is made later uh, when the patient is already very symptomatic. Uh, maybe in PICU or ICU uh, under ventilation. I don't know, Mialis, if you, if you have a, uh, a comment on, on this. Yeah, I think I agree that early on, uh, I think uh, every patient who actually gets uh, diagnosed uh, warrants a prophylactic admission. In, in, in my opinion, I think you, you agree with that as well as we've discussed. Uh, if there is access to monoclonal antibodies early on, I think that that's ideal. That's not available everywhere, unfortunately. So, you know, in that case, you know, plasmapheresis could be attempted, uh, which can be done maybe more broadly. If interferon beta is available uh, early on, again, that availability might be an issue there in certain hospitals and many hospitals, uh, that could be given. I don't see a problem giving both a monoclonal and interferon beta. They probably synergize in, you know, uh, in getting your virus down. Uh, there is a percent of patients who have interferon beta autoantibodies. It's between 10 and 20 percent. And you know, again, if that is known that the patient doesn't have uh, autoantibodies against beta, I think it makes it even more compelling if it is available. If it is not known, you know, there the question is, you know, do you give it regardless? And you know, maybe it will overcome if it is available, or if you might not act. Uh, so then it gets a little bit more tricky there. But uh, I think early on, uh, uh, even having the patient in the hospital in case they would progress to develop hypoxemia so that you act on that you know, a day or two earlier than otherwise, I think it's important to prophylactically admit patients and consider those uh, uh, modalities uh, wherever they're available. So uh, quite a few countries will and, and uh, hospitals would not have access to either monoclonals or uh, to uh, beta interferon. Uh, what would you do then? Wait and see, and if they see, uh, if they get more severe, this might be a this this is now a type one interferon loss of function or opposite patients. I'm asking. I think there's uh, a nice uh, correspondence piece uh, in Jackie. Uh, actually, that paper was also included in Paul's uh, uh, recent paper from all of from uh, Sweden, where uh, plasmapheresis was uh, uh, was done. I mean, we also saw that in this case. So you know that might be an option. It certainly decreases the, the autoantibody titers. And in the beginning, that might make a big difference. It, it, I think in the cases that we've seen, 
throughout the literature, it appears that you need, you know, maybe three, four daily sessions in order to reach the point to decrease them sufficiently. So that might be an option. And I would say monitoring carefully so that if they develop hypoxemia, I think it's important to initiate uh, steroids uh, early. So those would be two potential modalities, not maybe the ideal for with monoclonals and interferon beta, but still better than having the patients at home and present late with severe hypoxemia. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul, you did have a nice slide on this, uh, where actually the plasmapheresis alone did not in increase interference signature, but you did not do it daily. Would you agree with Mihail uh, that if you don't have beta interferon, uh, uh, you don't know the beta interferon uh, status, the uh, anti-beta uh, interferon status of the patient, would you then do daily uh, plasmapheresis aggressively? Yeah, if there's no other option, yeah, I, I agree with Mihalis. I think it's uh, it's probably the, I mean, it's it's quite invasive treatment, but it's probably the only way to go. Uh, in, in our patients, we did everything, sort of. We did uh, con um, plasma exchange and beta interferon uh, and so uh, it's hard to say which of these two uh, increase the ISG signature. Uh, but um, I mean, these patients can go very, uh, can be very severe very quickly. So uh, I think the key is to act fast and aggressively. And Benedict, you agree as well? Or do yeah, you I, I fully agree. Back? I think everything needs to be done to decrease the viral load as quickly as possible because these patients are not able to control the virus in the early phase of the infection. So uh, the, the way we have to decrease this viral load uh, is to restore the uh, interferon action. So uh, by plasmapheresis or by interferon beta uh, if there is no uh, anti-beta autoantibodies. All these options are uh, possible. Um, Giving, giving interferon beta in a patient with very high CRP and, uh, and a very inflammatory patient is something that uh, need to be avoided, I think, or uh, think carefully uh, before uh, mixing uh, interferon beta and uh, inflammation. In the patient that Natalie presented, he received dexamethasin before we started the beta interferon and the CRP was controlled. So it was more uh, comfortable to uh, start the, uh, uh, the beta interferon in this patient. And uh, again, uh, one more thought, uh, if you have access to the monoclonal antibodies, you have to make a choice between the monoclonal and the plasmapheresis because otherwise you clean your monoclonal very expensive monoclonal antibodies by the plasma pheresis. So it's probably something that you have to avoid. Yeah. That's a very uh, one very last point, if uh, we have a minute. I think in a, in a, in a paper that uh, is uh, uh, under uh, revision now, and Paul is also included, in the patients, these are not APSET patients, but I think you know from the few we've seen, the pattern is very similar. Uh, in those patients who have autoantibodies type 1 interference, especially those that are hypoxemic in the ICU, they really don't clear their PCRs for several weeks. So all patients with autoantibodies in the ICU actually were still PCR positive after four weeks of admission. So I think, again, to add to the point that, you know, probably even late in the course, if, you know, through plasmapheresis, for example, as it was shown in this second case, if one could decrease the titers, that might still, you know, uh, stop the, the progression of giving more viral uh, proliferation that then instigates secondary hyperinflammation in these people. Now, we have still a few more minutes and uh, uh, there are questions on uh, other diseases with anti-interferon, uh, uh, type one interferon, uh, uh, and such as incontinentia pigmenta, uh, uh, Andres asks about the mechanism in that disease to create such autoantibodies. Uh, Sarah asks on tragopathies, whether they have more commonly anti-interferon antibodies. Does anyone want to comment on these? Yeah, I, I can answer the uh, other tragopathy question. So we, we, did, we happened to uh, follow another tragopathy, uh, which are patients uh, with CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. 
And um, we, we actually collected so far uh, nine patients with TTLA4 hyperinsufficiency uh, who had COVID-19. And, and we tested six of them um, for anti autoantibodies to type 1 interferon, and none of them were positive. Um, and, and we were actually pretty concerned, but because we thought patients with TTLA-4 would do poorly with COVID. And so far out of our six patients, only one had to be hospitalized and did not require mechanical ventilation. So although this is also a disease with propensity for autoimmunity, uh, you know, the mechanism is quite different. Uh, they don't have autoantibodies to type 1 interferon. And, and so they, they really don't, as far as we know, they don't do poorly with COVID-19. We had the same experience with CTLA-4 patient and a very mild COVID. And on the other hand, for incontinence epigmenti patients, it's a different story because we had uh, one patient with severe COVID and autoantibodies. And uh, as you said, there's a fourth of them who have autoantibodies. Uh, and uh, to answer shortly, we have we don't know the mechanism. Uh, so any ideas or discussion are I'm very we're very happy to collaborate, uh, but we have no idea yet. And uh, uh, I think uh, we have mostly covered. There's the question by Anthony whether. Any has anyone has any experience on, on children under age 12? I think Benedict has some experience and she already did mention that. Do you wanna comment again? I think we have to do everything to vaccinate this patient as soon as possible. And uh, even if they are younger than 12, uh, it's life saving. So we have to do everything to convince our authorities to have the, the opportunity to vaccinate. And uh, as I mentioned, the very early preliminary data uh, are encouraging, and I think these patients are able, will be able to uh, have good immune response after vaccination. The same is also uh, 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 the, the same discussion is also uh, applicable for uh, patients with uh, TLR seven and. Uh, uh, other uh, defect in the response to uh, interferon. We didn't mention this patient, but of course the discussion uh, are very similar. And again, they are uh, patient at very high risk and everything has to be done to offer uh, vaccination, even in very young children. Now we have about two minutes um, and we have two, uh, two, still two more questions. Uh, I would... Uh, First comment that um, uh, there's, there's another question on nf -kappa beta defects, uh, but there, I think we just lack data to go delve into deeper into this. So I think we will have to skip it because of lack of data. And then to Ephemia, how could you explain the absence of neutralizing antibodies after severe COVID infection in a child without primary immunodeficiency? Uh, well, my guess is that uh, he or she is primary immunodeficient, but we haven't dug deep enough. Maybe it's not in the exome. Maybe it's only in the you know uh, uh, genomic uh, 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 RNA seq or or, or long uh, long read sequencing or whatever that would probably find it something still. Uh, my guess is that uh, there is a, eventually there will be a disease for that for his patient as well. Uh, all right, Louise asks, I follow a two year old female with stat two loss of function. In my country, monoclonals are not available for children. Hyperimmune intravenous immunoglobulin is not effective, but we don't know vaccine dosage. How would you pr proceed when nothing can be done? Uh, Benedict? Uh, regarding the, the dosage for vaccination, I can only share what we did. Uh, and we gave the full dose of uh, uh, RNA uh, vaccines to uh, young children. Uh, the youngest was uh, three years old, if I remember well. So it's a, a beginning of answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, Otherwise, uh, I would do everything to avoid COVID and uh, maybe um, limit the interaction, uh, limit uh, school uh, uh, and social uh, interaction uh, to avoid uh, 
uh, uh, contamination. Yeah, I think that's all. Just, does anyone else have anything else to suggest to this little girl? I think, you know, it, it, high, uh, high titer convalescent plasma has had very mixed results. There is always the possibility that actually some of those uh, could, could contain not antibodies against type 1 interference. So if one had the option to really have high titer neutralizing convalescent plasma given early without the presence of type 1 interferon antibodies, that might be a potential option. But there are too many ifs there with regards to, you know, testing and, uh, and being sure, so. Yeah. If I was uh, in Lewis's uh, situation, I would do anything in my power to convince the authorities that to this child, I will give the vaccine. <laughs> but uh, also the, the, the suggestion of uh, Siobhan is excellent. Uh, of yeah. course, we need to vaccinate the, uh, uh, the, the parents and brothers and sisters yeah. and uh, all people that are around these very uh, high risk patients. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's also a way to go around, but that's not a perfect way. The best would be to vaccinate the child as well, but Chauvin has a very good point there. There All is right. one thing we forgot to mention. Benedict mentioned it briefly in patients that do not produce type 1 interferons, uh, TLR7, RF7, TLR3. These could be treated early, uh, not only with interferon beta, but also with interferon alpha, yeah. uh, because they do respond, unlike all 20 body patients or if they're one deficient. So this is another option to consider. Yeah, that's true as well. Thank you, Paul. Okay, I think uh, we are close to closing this session. Uh, and, uh, and many thanks. And with these words, I like to thank all the panelists and all the presenters for their active participation. I think this cleared uh, our minds a little, but of course we have dire lack of data and a dire lack of, of uh, resources to do this as well as we could. And, and I hope everyone a lot of fighting spirit while the endemic is still going on. Thank you to all. Bye. <laughs>